So I'm just finishing up this mix for a client. Uh, it's a band called Rain Song, and I thought I'd go through how I'd mixed it. Um, it's an interesting project for me because I didn't record it. Um, most of the stuff had been recorded by the artist himself, um, although I'd done the drums remotely. And what's interesting about it for me is I don't get to mix uh, a huge amount of this kind of music, but there was quite a lot of things I did differently in it that I haven't done on a lot of things I've mixed recently. So I want to go through and have a look at those bits individually and see what's interesting about them. We'll start off by hearing the original mix by the artist. The version you're hearing at the moment is just the instrumental in the background that's the sort of nearly finished version. Um, so this is the original mix by the artist. And while there's nothing in particular wrong with this mix, it's it's kind of finely balanced and stuff like that. Um, everything's like broadly well recorded. To me, it was lacking a little bit of depth and a little bit of impact. The drums in particular were programmed in Logic. And I think while you can get good results programming drums in Logic for this kind of style of like psychedelic indie shoegaze rock, I think you really need like a live drum kit for that, for that energy, for that space. Obviously the artist has got, in my opinion, a pretty good ear for, for sounds. None of the sounds were like egregious in particular, but I just thought pretty much every aspect could be improved by some small amount. And he hit me up on Instagram and asked if I'd be interested in doing a mix. And this is the original mix as it was sent to me. Um, so you can see we've got some Logic drums and then there's you know, various kind of audio recordings um, with the original processing there. And then we've got the vocals in the middle and the bass at the top. So first thing was to just go and clean all that stuff up. So I'm very lucky to work with a great drummer, um, Stuart Pringle, who I work with a lot on, on drum recordings and kindly did a favor for me and did some remote recording in his home studio. And we've just got two takes here. You can see I've used most of take two up until the second chorus um, where I've used take one for the majority of the song. The only difference in the two takes was I think in take two he added this kind of syncopated snare displacement um, which I think was just not really in keeping with the style of the original track. Cool let's have a look at how some of these drums are done so um, for the kick close mic we've got an AKG D12 and a warm audio Fet Junior. Um, nothing particularly different I've done about this is what I've done in other um, drum mixes. I'm gating the close mic uh, on the in pretty pretty hard and I didn't actually gate the out microphone at all and I'm using some Kramer Helios which um, I really love because it has kind of great bottom end to it and then we've got some Slate Digital just SSL EQ and compression and a little bit of um, a little bit of channel uh, and that sounds a bit like this with those plugins switched off I'm also adding in Logic's test oscillator and that is gated um, to the kick-in mic and it's tuned to 43 hertz. For the snares I've done something I don't normally do. I'd used our bass actually on the top mic so there's a couple of 57s top and bottom it's pretty standard. Got some close, um, got some gating on the close mic not quite as aggressive as the kick mic because we want to try and retain some of the ghost notes and then yeah, our bass so without it it's a, a kind of fine top snare with our bass it really brings out that honk got that tuned to 180 hertz um, and then a bit of eq and compression i think both these eq and compression moves i'd lifted from uh, dave's original drum mix i don't normally uh, go to this 1176 style compressor but I wanted to try and retain some of what he'd done then we've got our snare bottom mic nothing particularly crazy there the phase was good on these already so I didn't need to reflip it but obviously checked and then something I don't normally do is I actually sampled the original snare um, the Logic Drummer instrument you know it's it's flexible enough that you can mute out the um, the kicks and snares so I muted out the kicks and hi-hats and cymbals and just left with the snare track and then I generated a MIDI track from the snare close mic uh, by going to the track replace or double drum track and then just made sure the snare MIDI file was pointing at the correct drummer instrument. And that snare on its own sounds like this. 
which already has got like a bit of kind of stereo width to it. And then I kept Dave's processing on there, which I'm assuming was part of a, a, a default logic preset, some multiband compression and two compressors by the looks of things. I think I might put the second one on. Doesn't look like it's doing anything. In fact, yeah, that's doing nothing. Um, so, my, you know, the two snares I was given sound like this. And then when we blend in the sampled snare, it's just got a little bit more kind of 3D quality to it. Um, all of that is running into a very similar kind of channel strip as the kick, um, although I'm using a G-series console, but same you know, EQ and compression. It looks like for whatever reason, I've swapped the EQ and compressor around on, on this channel strip. So it's been gated and compressed before it hits the EQ. Moving on to the toms, you can see I've actually stripped the um, tom tracks down to their bare bones. So, you know, originally the files kind of looked a bit like that, but um, I used the logic strip silence feature. Doing that, you might think that the gate is kind of redundant, but I still felt it was kind of tightening up the sound. For toms, I typically use the Oxford drum gate, whereas for other close mics, I might use the logic one. Sometimes I'm using them in conjunction, like on the kick in. Uh, and I've also done a little bit of transient design on this. Um, I really like this kilohertz thing. Um, there's not a massive amount of, of tom fills in here. Um, I really wanted that kind of dry sound from them, so I didn't do too much processing to them. Um, I'll talk about reverb and stuff later, but the other thing to note with the kick snare and toms is they're all being routed to bus 13, which is this parallel compressor, and um, I don't use parallel compression a huge amount, but I find it really effective sometimes. And I'm using the UAD Distressor. Pretty smashy, so without it, the kick and snare sound like this. And with the parallel compressor there. So I'm using the 20 to one. And I'm, I think Distortion 3, I think it's third order harmonics. Kind of slow attack, quick release. The idea of just using the the the, the parallel compression on on the close mics means you're not really smashing the 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 cymbal sound, and this is something I've kind of picked up from watching um, Vance Powell, which I thought was kind of an interesting way of working. You can hit that compressor really hard, and you don't bring up all the all the metal and the room sound. Next, I've got this summing stack called Rest of Kit, and um, in that you've got two summing stacks. You've got the overheads and the underheads. The reason I put those microphones within summing stacks is so I can use Logic Directional Mixer. And you can see I've done a bit of directional mixing on both of these. All this is really doing is narrowing everything below 120, and then I'm keeping the everything above 120, you know, the same kind of width. That's just because I was finding the kick drum was a little bit, a little bit too stereo in both of these mics. Not going to be a huge difference on and off, but it, it made enough of a difference to me. So the underhead pair, to me, gives a slightly kind of better overall impression of the kit. This is a little bit left heavy because this is a ride cymbal section and I'll, I'll talk about how I address that later. It evens out a little bit more in this section. And actually you can see there, the one of the, uh, another thing I, I don't sort of typically tend to do, I've actually got some automation on the underheads where I'm punching in this um, this Pro Q3 just on the right side and you can see it's it's off now and then when we hit bar 41 it's just catching this bit of crash symbol in the right channel so the underheads give a sort of really good overall impression of the kit whereas the overheads to me are a lot brighter and they have a lot more detail uh, both of these pairs of mics are being run into uh, some UAD 1073. And then the only other thing about the overhead mics themselves is I'm using the Waves phase correction tool. Uh, you can just see that the overhead channel is being delayed by some fractional amount, 0.60 milliseconds, which is only about 26 samples. I just found that slightly tightened up with the underheads. It's, again, it wasn't radical. And then we've got this ambient microphone, which sounds like this on its own. 
It's actually a mono mic, but I've, I've stereoized it. I've added a bit of Fielding DSP Reviver, which is a really great plugin, just giving it a little bit of edge to it. A great free compressor by Audio Damage called Rough Rider. They're actually on version three, but I've, I've stated before in other videos, I much prefer version one. Um, so really heavy, smashy compression. A bit of EQ, I uh, just was obviously finding these low MIDI bits a bit annoying. And then the UAD Oceanway Studio. I'm using this as a, as a re-miking tool, basically. So I'm using just the near microphones. I've dialed them in at about six and a half feet, and it's a pair of C12s facing outwards. This is cool because you've got uh, different mics for the near, the mid, uh, you've got some ribbons there and, and the fars, and you can have them facing in or out and you can EQ it and all that kind of stuff. So that just made our ambient mic sound a bit more ambient. And then lastly, uh, in this collection of mics that was provided to me was this Periscope, and the Periscope is a great sounding mic. I did find in this track that it was sounding really trashy on verse sections, or, or rather I just didn't feel I needed it for the verse sections. So again, something I rarely ever do is um, mute microphones out for sections. So you can see the Periscope's not in for the intro kind of pickup drum fill. And it comes in for the chorus. And then it drops out for the verse. I've processed that with some Kush Audio tube um, model thingy. Um, it's kind of like a transformer modeler. And then there's a bit of Pro-Q3 um, doing a lot of work there. Um, and then some RX950, which just makes it sound even trashier. So there's a bit of low pass filter on there and reducing the audio bandwidth. I see this microphone more like an effect than most things. So all of those microphones are summed into this rest of kit stack and they sound like this. I'm using a bit of Soothe 2. I'm using this Symbol Smooth preset just to you can hear the delta, kind of what it's getting rid of. Some virtual mix rack. Um, really liking uh, these um, console emulations. Um, just some standard SSL stuff. A bit more Pro-Q3. Uh, this is just ducking down some of the stick sound on the ride cymbal. Uh, it's not perfect, and I, I could have been a bit more aggressive with it, but it just kind of helped. It's not, I mean, it's getting a bit of a hiss out there, but if I, if I go to a, a section where the ride cymbal is a bit clearer, like I think in this chorus, It's, it's, it's taking out a bit of symbol as a sort of collateral damage. But I just found it tamed that ride symbol. Uh, then we're going into some Studa. I'm using the, the native version of this rather than the, the uh, one off the DSP. I've got more into using the calibration tool, so I'm switching auto calibration off. Yeah, the Studa, really, really great bit of kit. And then some Neve, Neve compressors. I've never used a hardware Neve compressor, but I found this is a nice kind of subtle transparency-ish compression uh, for using on like overhead ambient mic stuff like that so once I'd got the drums kind of balanced um, I ran a copy of the drums out of the computer into my uh, copycat and got this nice kind of syncopated breakbeaty kind of sound because of the buffer size I was running at the microphone was the print was out of sync with the mic a little bit so I just kind of manually lined it up by eye looking at the um the first kick drum which was you know kind of um on the beat there and I I ended up taking the microphone exact I mean it was something like a few samples off being exactly as an eighth note out and then I just corrected it and that sounds really good blended in if I bring in the close microphones, for example, and I mute that out. So that sounded really good. And I also ran a copy out of the computer through a couple of guitar pedals. This is like going through an MXR Dynacomp. 
a Proco Rat and a Electro Harmonics Memory Man. That sounds a bit like this. You can see that's only being used in the verses and the outro section. Just to tame it a little bit, I've used a little bit of high and low pass or high and low shelf uh, filters. And again, I'm using a bit of, bit of waves. This is just knocking it 8.6 milliseconds in one way. It just so it sat better with the overhead mics. And that kind of actually mostly kind of swaps places with the periscope. You can see how it periscope in the chorus and then that in the verses. So that's kind of nice. So all of those drums are sounding pretty decent to me. I ran them through a little bit more of the Kush tube transformer. A bit more virtual mix rack. I found this New York thing to be really kind of nicely aggressive. A bit more SSL. A DBX160. And then more Studer. There's um, two return tracks on here. There's uh, Bus 5, which is you'll see crop up all over this is actually one of dave's original reverbs that he had in his original mix this is the advantage of working from the project large bright thing i've renamed it dame dave drum verb so i could get back to it easily there's not much of that in there but it just gives the drums a little bit of color from the original and then i'm using uh, some outer verb and we can have a look at the outer verb patch it's a the live room from Barefoot Audio, which is Eric Valentine's studio. I downloaded these recently for something else. There's a video incoming in the future. You might be able to work out what that is. But I really like this, um, what's this, live room, a 25 feet direct. They're quite good impulse responses, these. There's a, a lot to choose from. They sound really good. So without that, the drums sound like this. And then just blending it in. So that sounded good to me. Uh, let's have a look at the bass. The bass was provided as a DI, but David done his own kind of processing on it. I had to go through and um, and, and flex time little bits of this. This looks more flexed than it actually is because eventually I just grabbed the whole thing and stuck a quarter note flex on there. But there was one or two bits that just needed a bit of a bit of care and attention. I think there was also the bit I had to tune something as well. Uh, just where the intonation had got a little bit um, kind of ropey in the upper register. It wasn't like a massive, I mean, you can see it's, it's not too bad, but um, for, I mean, for, for a real instrument, that's kind of fine. But there was one or two bits I had to sort out. And these color-coded regions are where I went in and actually had to manually edit the bass by cutting it up. But that's pretty standard as far as I'm concerned. So David actually processed this with, with Logic's own presets, but I really like using the DI kind of as is. So this is what the DI sounds like on its own. It's, it's decent enough. A little bit of EQ. This might have been just to, might have been, I don't know what we're doing, dropping some 150 there. And then there's some R channel by Waves. Um, doing a bit of everything, a bit of compression, a little bit of EQ. And then this compressor by Arturia. I can't remember the name of it, but um, I've found this picky bass preset quite nice. And it just adds a little bit of something in there. So I duplicated that track and used um, these settings here on the, the bass amp sound. I'm gonna turn off the IO for a second. So we've got the original bass amp. I mean, Logic's bass amp designer is really good. I think this is the preset Dave provided to me. I'm just gonna run that out of the output so we can hear what's going on. Pretty sure this is either Dave's original EQ or close to it. A bit of API 550, doing some boosts at two and a half and 800 and a dip at 180 and bit of a boost at 40 and then some soothe which is doing this uh preset i've made to try and get rid of some of the squeaky fret noise no, it's not perfect but it, it tidied it up a bit and then i'm running that out of the computer using uh, the logics io and run that into a, a neve 1073 eq this is again something i don't do a lot in mixing i'm 
very pro hardware when it comes to recording but for mixing I haven't tended to do this that much but I knew I was going to print the sound anyway and I was kind of trying to be conservative with how much DSP the UAD was using um, so I, I kind of wanted that Neve EQ sound and I was lucky enough to have a 500 series next to me so once I got the sound that I was happy with I just recorded it out and this is the, the print of the bass amp so including the Neve EQ and if you put that with the DI their phase is good and everything like that so that's good I also ran the DI out of a bus and uh, returned that bus over here so we've just got a copy of the DI and this is only being used in the chorus sections so I wanted to do some distortion in parallel so I used the Sans Amp by Arturia and I just wanted even more gain out of it so I've used some more Kush transformer stuff a bit of pull tech to take out some 500 and then the Kramer tape and just this is really smashing it it's over biased and we're using the seven and a half inch uh, you can hear the difference there as it comes out of the verse when that channel turns off it drops down quite a bit but you know I did want to bring it up for the chorus and then lastly there's some pretty aggressive EQ on here the last thing I did was just to get the choruses sounding even bigger was I, I ran the uh, DI signal out of the computer and printed a couple of guitar pedals. So this is a, a tube zipper by Electro Harmonics. It's just got that huge valvey bottom end sound to it. It's really kind of broken up and, and aggressive. I love that. And I had to do a bit of EQ to get it to sit but it sounded good and then also through this um plasma pedal um which just sounds crazy and there's a bit more eq on there dipping out some mid-range so those two together and if i play the whole bass channel together without them and then bring them in Lastly, the bass was ran into another Helios um, and then some more virtual mix rack, just using a bit of SSL and some optical compression. It looks like a tweaked preset here. The main clean guitar part, I kept um, the original amp settings that Dave had. Uh, it had um, a Logic pedal board before the amp doing some compression, um, but again, because I knew I was doing a little bit of hardware mixing, I ran it out the computer and used my RNC compressor by FMR Audio. And uh, the print of the compressed version sounds like this. Let's turn the reverb off. And then I think this is um, Dave's original EQ. Where possible, I tried to keep his amp settings almost exactly the same as he had them. The only thing I might have done is, is move the mics around. So this is a 57 on the comb, but backed off. I don't think I touched the, e I might have touched the EQ on the amp a little bit, but I tried to keep it pretty much as he heard it. We've got a little bit, bit of Pro Q3. This band here is I was just hearing some kind of squealy frequencies. Um, that's something Soothe could do quite nicely as well, but I wanted to use Pro Q3. A bit of uh, 1073, brightening it up, and um, what are we doing here? That's a, a dip at 360. Uh, some gem dopamine, really love this for brightening things up. A bit of Pool tech, which is dipping out 1.5k and doing a bit of a boost at two uh, and a bit of a boost at one so it's a really strange we're boosting at one and two and then dipping out at one and a half so it's going to create a quite narrow dip there and then um, some Kramer pie
and I was so happy with the compression on this, I saved the preset. That's being run out into that same uh, bus five, which is Dave's standard reverb. And also I've sent it out to Valhalla Shimmer, which is a, you know, appropriately shoegazy kind of reverb. The preset I'm using is called Bloom. It's one I've um, created myself, but I've, I've, I've taken the influence from the Valhalla DSP website blog um, the where Sean talked about some of the presets on the old Elisis rack reverbs. Uh, it sounds like this. An issue I have with Valhalla Shimmer is the it can get a bit hissy. So we've got some EQ just to tighten up the bottom end. And then I'm using a couple of DSs after the reverb. You can hear what they're getting rid of. And uh, there's a second one doing this frequency. They sound a bit inaudible at the moment, but there are other things that are running into this bloom as well. I think some vocals as well. So it really kind of helps tidy that up a little bit. So that was the clean guitar. That runs throughout the whole track pretty much. Next was the fuzz guitar. This was the fuzz guitar that was supplied to me. Which sounded pretty good, but I, I wanted to reamp it. Dave had his own amp on there, which was this Logic uh, Marshall clone. First thing I did was I just put a low pass and high pass on here. I find with guitars you can low pass them way more than you think they've got a lot of hiss in them so without that and then with it so what i did was i actually rooted that out of three buses 16 17 and 18 and took that out of the mix so you weren't hearing the direct signal so uh, the reason i did this is like i copied the amp settings across twice so you've got the marshall there and you've got it here and i just did different microphone settings so on one of them i've got an re20 up on the grill and on the other one I've got a, a, a C414 condenser up on the grill didn't I don't think I touched the EQ on them so those amps uh, sound like you know this is what the, so this is what the dynamic amp sounds like without the amp with it. it sounds really good and this is what the condenser sounds like on its own which is much kind of brighter, which is exactly what we we're trying to achieve. I ran both of those out of the computer, the dynamic through an SSL EQ. I, I, I don't often do this, but I just found the ability to tweak particularly EQ uh, bands as I was mixing was, was really kind of useful. It's not a huge difference. I was trying to be quite conservative, um, but the dynamic mic through the SSL. I tried to stay organized and keep all the settings in the project notes. And I ran the condenser out through a Trident EQ. And together those two microphones sound like this. The nice thing about having them both run out through EQ at the same time meant I could boost in one and take from the other and the idea really of having a dynamic and a condenser is that you know you can really EQ the sound just by balancing the output of the channels lastly here i i ran a copy of the amp out using a ribbon through uad ocean way again and here i'm using the mid and far mics we've got um an rca a q3a uh at about 14 feet and at 18 feet we've got some N50s which I think are Neumanns which sounds like this really nice and bottom heavy I've got a couple of pull techs on there I'm using the waves ones mostly for CPU reasons I really like the UAD ones so we're doing a boost and kind of cut at 100 and some attenuation at 20k and a bit of a boost at 3k and then we're just dipping at 200 and then I'm using the directional mixer I think to widen it if I remember correctly Oh yeah, and just knock it a little bit to the right because I was finding it a bit left heavy. Um, probably I might actually narrow that. So those three mics together sounds like this. We've got some API 550 on the channel, just knocking some top end, being, doing a bit of a boost at 1.5 and a bit of a dip at 100. A 
bit of Siemens EQ. Sound toys do one of these as well, but I kind of think I prefer the Arturia one. And then lastly, a plugin which really saved my life on, on this mix. This is um, Corniff Audio's Amplified Instrument Processor, which is like a Swiss army knife for distorted guitars. There's some stuff happening in here, but the really important thing is this insufferable mid-range filter, which is amazing. So I'll just turn everything off. I'm not doing much here. There's just some EQ. There's a bit of high pass and low pass there. It's this thing though. one of those things like you don't realize what it's getting rid of until you switch it off so here's the frequency it's knocking out which is wild how prevalent that is so that's um it's a bit of it's a bit of 3k but you've got this octave thing so i think the thing it's also dipping a bit of six and you can also dip presumably a bit lower which is um I don't know, one and a half or something but um that's all i needed and i just knocked it down by that and uh, the difference is Doing a bit of stereo width there and you can also do this analog channel variant stuff which i can't really hear the difference but you know it sounds cool sometimes and it's got a compressor which i'm not using but anyway that is the fuzz guitar you can hear there probably that i accidentally left the reverb on there so yeah that reverb is just to give it a bit more of the flavor of the original next is uh some channels i've just called guitar effects these sounded like they already had stuff on them you can see i've frozen them here so i think these are pretty much identical to how Dave had them. I'm not gonna go through each one, one by one. You can see there are different performances in the case of one and two are the same performance and, and three and four are the same performance. Dave was doing some automation. I just found it simpler just to be a bit more aggressive and actually just mute stuff out rather than have it. I've also, I've also done a bit of volume automation. I found it tricky to get these balanced at some points. So I, didn't, I haven't really done too much here. I think I, I think I added the EQs on and on this third one, I've added a bit of Soothe. Um, Looks like I'm doing something with that one. I don't know, let's have a little listen. Yeah, quite a lot actually, you can hear those frequencies which are being ducked out. And the only thing I did kind of differently was I, I recorded some wah pedal automation for this Riff 4 one. So I've added this pedal board in. I think the compressor was from Dave's mix. And then I've added some, looks like some Waves SSL uh, doing some compression and a bit of the Chris Lord Algae slap. Quite like this plugin, it's, it's cheap and cheerful. I think it was free actually. All of those are being summed. We've got a bit of Pro Q3. Um, dipping out that horrible four and a half K fizz and they're running through um, bus 5 which is Dave's original reverb and he'd also had a, a copy it's, it's the same preset just with the reverse button hit and so there's some reverse reverb on that I think there was like differing amounts on each channel but I just slapped it on the bus so that it was subject to the EQ looks like there's a bit of API doing a dip at 20k not really much Apart from the volume automation, I think that one was pretty, pretty simple. The last guitar was this thing called Arp Guitar, which is really very quiet in the intro and you can hear it a little bit at the beginning of verse one, but it sort of comes into its own from, from bar 33 onwards. And there's a little bit of volume automation. Um, this thing happening from bar 65 is, is really kind of, in my opinion, key to the song. So I kind of kept that quite high. Just on its own, it sounded like this. So it's pretty well played and it's already got quite a bit of processing on there. So I've got a bit of Waves R comp, which sometimes I use just to do sort of very transparent compression. There's Dave's original amp on there, which is the, the Marshall thing. I think the only thing I definitely changed about this is I changed the mic from a dynamic to a condenser just to make it a bit brighter. Just felt like it cut through the mix a bit better. There's some channel EQ. This is similar to Dave's original EQ. I think I just dropped the gain and tidied it up a bit and then there's a bit of echo boy to make it stereo or echo boy junior i should say so i've got this in ping pong mode 
I haven't really done much else there. That that kind of is nice. And then a bit of virtual mix rack. It's quite a lot going on here by the looks of things. So we've got some New York virtual tube collection thing, which I think is supposed to be a bit API, -y, but I'm not really sure. And then some SSL EQ doing a bit of 10K shelf and a bit of high passing. Some Neve EQ doing more high end and more high passing. And then a distressor preset looks like it's called acoustic guitar natural and then some revival doing some shimmer so adding more top end and then a trimmer at the end which isn't doing anything by the looks of things so that is running out to buses five and six which is dave's two space designers and then also 14 which i think is bloom so that's got a bit of bloom on there and if i solo bloom now you might hear more clearly what these ds's are doing It's pretty subtle, but they're just clearing up that kind of range. And last thing to have a look at is the is the vocals. You can see here these these green tracks that have got H written on them. Um, these are the original vocals that were given to me. I'm just going to turn off all the processing and all the sends. And all I did with them was just melodyne them. Um, so you can see there's the melodyne. This is no reflection on the performance, like uh, Melodyne. I, I don't Melodyne absolutely everything, but because this has got quite a lot of harmonies, I think it was quite important to try and match the amount of vibrato between the, the, the two harmonies. So the performance is kind of strange in the sense that we have what I thought was the main vocal, and then it's that's double tracked, but then at points the double track would move to a harmony. So that is what it is. I did a little bit of editing for the original tracks, and then I did a bounce in place, but it transpired and I needed to do a lot more editing. So you can see there's actually like a bit of volume automation, which I very rarely do with vocals, literally just on certain words where the compressor wasn't clamping down enough. And then on the double track I've done, um, where I've like snipped the region and, and done some uh, volume stuff there. Um, but there's a fair bit of processing on this. I'll just turn everything off to begin with. Um, the thing common to every track is Logic's noise gate, which I don't need to talk about, and um, a de uh, just using the Waves one, kind of into that one at the moment. And there's a bit of virtual mix rack on, on everything, and I think I'm using the same channel strip, which is this London tube thing, some optical compression, some 1176 compression, the blue stripe, and then SSL EQ and... SSL Dynamics. This is kind of similar to the channel strip we often use at the studio, although there's a Neve at the front of this, but I didn't like the sound of it on this. Let's just listen to the verse. These aren't perfect and probably the thing which is least finished, but it's kind of there or thereabouts. So it sounds a bit like this. Time to choose a sign. Drifting yeah, there's some kind of glitches in there. I think it's to do with the automation, but I think that gets ironed out when you bounce it. I listened to the mix I did yesterday in Apple earbuds, and I was just finding was some words were just vanishing from the mix, so I had to go in and do the automation. The double track has also got some decapitator, which is a distortion plugin. Time to and then some waves ADT because it's kind of got that kind of psychedelic -y sound. Uh, so I thought that'd be kind of cool. Time to choose a sign. Drifting. I tried a waves vocal rider on the main vocals, but they were just, it was just, I wasn't really happy with what it was doing. I have used it on all the chorus BVs though. It just sometimes tidies things up. There were points in the chorus where some of these edits sound quite abrupt in solo and the words being cut off short, but in the mix, I think it's fine. The reason I was doing that was because to me, it was just a little bit sloppy how one word would last longer than another. If that was a really deliberate move, then my bad. But on the first round of feedback, it didn't get picked up on, so I've kind of kept it in there. But it's just so, for example, these ones line up with the natural end of this word here and you know where this word ends, these ones are a kind of not not bleeding on too long so vocal processing is quite a f 
quite a lot going on here. Um, Time to... Running into another DS, I'm just using Logic's one. Time to... Choose a side. And then Pro Q3, which is basically acting like another DSA. Um, this is something I struggled with a little bit with this recording. Um, some UAD doing a bit of 3.2K. And a, just, I like using the UAD just for the gain, to be honest. I don't even do the EQ sometimes. And then some Omnipressor, or Omnitech rather, which is um, Time to choose made by black rooster audio who I, I really like the plugins but i don't have many of them but i've got um this and this is an altec clone and they've got an altec preamp clone which i really like and they've got some free plugins too i quite like this on vocals and then i've got some studa doing tapey Time stuff to a sign. So, not too high and then gem dopamine just to compensate for the lack of top end Time to... And then these return tracks, or send tracks rather, there's quite a few of them. So we've got five is doing our, our standard reverb and, and 14 is doing bloom. I think we've talked about those already. Time to choose a sign. And then we've got 10. Uh, so 10 is um, some slapback. And there was originally... Um, a little bit of tape slap on the original channel strips um, Dave gave me and I just put it on a return track to have a bit more control. It's using basically the, this this tape plugin. I think I've tweaked the time a little bit. I've added a little bit of Kramer tape before, which does its own slap thing, which sounds really good. Um, and I've over-biased it and cranked up the record level to make it sound a bit more kind of vintage-y. Just backed off on some top end. So 10 on its own. Time to it's just got that kind of nice vintagey 60s feel to it 11 we've got some spring reverb this is actually the spring box from logic's pedal ball which i think sounds really good i've got quite a few spring reverbs but i kind of like this one and this is what dave had in his original mix so i just kept up with it the only things i've added here is um time to choose a sign bit of eq just to knock some of those frequencies down and then some stereo imaging Time to 23 we've got some pretty hardcore vocal compression here this is one of those things that i i might actually print back in on a channel and go through and edit because i was finding this amount of compression was really bringing out some of the artifacts in the original recording so it's going into a ds -er first um, and then it's going into another corner of audio thing, this um, talkback compressor, and then a blue stripe 1176, and then some EQ just to take a, a bit of bottom out and a bit of top. Um, so without it, it sounds like this. Let's just listen to the chorus instead. And then I'll punch it in. in the warmth of the sun. Of your world. So you can hear the the compressor is like making those abrupt stops sound a bit kind of worse, but when you compensate it with a lot of the spatial effects. Burn, burn in the the and the last thing I did was I ran everything out to bus 25, which is a, just a channel called vocal effects. Um, Despite what people on the internet say, CLA Vocals is actually really good and I use it quite a lot. And um, even though some people seem to hate it for some reason. So just using the bite EQ and a little bit of the push compression and then a quarter note delay and a bit of stereoizing. On the channel strip itself, I sometimes find it can be a little bit too top endy. Uh, but on a return track, it worked quite nicely. And then after that, I've got some lexicon reverb. I, I, kind of prefer the uh the, uh the the uad one to these but again i was kind of trying to be careful with with cpu and stuff so so all the vocal processing together burn in the warmth of the sun. 
So that's pretty much what the mix looks like. Um, the final thing I'll do is just talk through the mix bus and master processing. I decided to separate these processes out because, um, I mean, firstly, just from a sort of aesthetic point of view, the mixer was getting really tall by just having a load of plugins on one strip. But everything on this mix bus, um, so basically everything's rooted through to bus one. And this is mostly through coloration and kind of EQing and then the actual traditional master output i've routed that through to bus 29 and that's mostly stuff to do with limiting and, and making things loud so the mix bus um, i'll just play this section end of verse one into the chorus and just talk through what's going on i'm just going to pull the master channel down a little bit so we've got some virtual mix bus uh, just doing some Hollywood tube collection stuff and I've got it on console mode rather than preamp mode. A bit of Kush Clarifonic, which is a really lovely plugin for brightening things up. I love it. If I turn it off. And then we've got some SSL, doing about 3-4 dB of compression. And then this Waves TG mastering thing. This is only doing an EQ and a bit of spreading. So the EQ is taking as if it was a seven and a half inch tape and it's brightening up. We've got some Ampex, which is fattening everything up really nicely. A bit of Soothe, uh, just to DS it even more. As you can hear, as soon as I enable Soothe, the, you know, everything starts going a little bit crazy. Uh, and then I've got some pool tech here, uh, which is doing a bit of a boost at 60, a little bit of a dip at 20. Really not much, because by the time I'd got to this point, I was really happy with the mix. And just lastly, the master channel. We've got some Oxford Inflator. I recently read somewhere that you're supposed to have the effect on 100% and then just adjust the curve and input gain, which is, you know, contrary to how I was using it before, where I was just using the effect on like 10, 15% or something. I've then got a bit of um, hard clipping. Which you can see is not doing a ton. And then we've got some L2. I quite like L2, even though, again, a lot of people seem to hate this plugin, but I, I really like it. I'm only doing a DB in this instance, and then after that, I've got um, Pro L2, which I'm not doing any limiting. I'm certainly not adding any more gain with that. I've got an eight times over sampling, and I've got the transient and release on 0%. There's some other cool things you can do with this plugin that um, I'm not really doing with, but I've got it. I'm doing it in, in true peak limiting mode, so it's like the last thing in the chain. So just to give that a comparison to the original for the same section, so this is running out the output. So it's a very, very different mix. I'm not, I'm not, um, you know, comparing the two in that sense. It's, it's kind of a lot of artistic decisions which have been made, which are different to, to that version. But um, I think it's, you know, my one's certainly a, a, a lot more aggressive and a lot more bottom heavy, and I think it's got a bit more kind of depth to it. And the original one, you know, there's a, a lot of sonics from it that I've tried to retain where possible, you know, the amp settings and the types of reverb and a lot of the processing on the vocals. But, um, yeah, I've just kind of tried to treat it as if I'd been sent some stems from something, and um, which is exactly what happened. Anyway, I'm going to make these drum stems available for download, so have a look in the description for 
how to access those if you want. If you're a London-based band, I'd be really interested in working with you. Uh, have a look on the channel to see how to get in contact, whether that be for mixing or for production and engineering. I'd you know like to see something through start to finish. So get in contact if that's something that's interesting to you.